Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. I'm Yugen and thank you for joining me today. In our lesson today, we're going to be focusing on biomes, biospheres and ecosystems. The context of this is important. It's important for us to be able to understand what is the biosphere. And then we're going to link that to looking at biomes in the context of South Africa and the variety of biomes we have. And then finally, we're going to look at ecosystems. Let's get straight into unpacking some important terminology as we get into this lesson. We can look at some terms, and then we can look at the components of biospheres. Right. So let's try and understand the concept of a biosphere. The word bio refers to living organisms, and a sphere refers to something that's a globe. So in terms of the Earth, we know that the biosphere is that part of the Earth's surface where humans and other organisms are able to live. So guys, when we talk of the Earth, we know that the Earth supports a variety of different organisms, life forms. The Earth is regarded as a sphere. So the bio would refer to the living organisms. So if we understand the context of interaction of organisms in the environment, we would need to unpack where do these living organisms exist and how do they interact with the environment. So let's unpack that by looking at what it is made up of. So the biosphere is made up of the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the atmosphere. So these three components form the important parts of the, the biosphere. We also know that the biosphere extends to about seven to 8,000 meters above the sea and around six to 8,000 meters below the sea level. So if we just looked at the context of where we are and the context of where we stand on the surface of the earth, remember that as we go up further into the atmosphere, there's a large variety of organisms that live there. Likewise, we can go into the surface of the earth, into the soil, into the deepest parts of the ocean. These are habitats that support life forms. So we refer to them as the biosphere, both in terms of the atmosphere as well as the aquatic parts of the environment. The components of the biosphere, as I mentioned, can be divided into the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere. Let's take each one of these and get the context to what they mean. The biosphere consists of, as you would look at this image, the illustrations of the three parts. So in terms of the living components, they interact with the atmosphere, which is predominantly the air that we have in our environment, as well as the earth, which is the lithosphere, and this refers to the soil, the rocks that we have life forms living on and supported by, as well as the aquatic parts or the water in our oceans, rivers, seas, and lakes. And so these three components collectively contribute to the existence of life on Earth. When we look at the atmosphere, it's important to understand what the atmosphere is made up of. What is the atmosphere made up of? Predominantly gases. Let's try and unpack what these gases are. So surrounding the Earth, we have a layer of air called the atmosphere. The gases that surround the Earth are mainly made up of nitrogen, which is about 71%, oxygen, which is about 21%, with a small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that water vapor also plays an important part of our atmosphere, and that concentration may vary. We also have a buildup of other gases that make a very small percentage of the gases in our atmosphere. Why is the atmosphere important? The oxygen, the gases that are vital, are important to supporting important processes like cellular respiration, photosynthesis. So we will look at the impact that that has on living organisms. So processes such as respiration, photosynthesis, and the filtering of sunlight help to protect living organisms from the harmful solar radiation. It's important that we recognize that the layer of atmosphere is also an important filter to the harmful UV radiation that we experience on Earth. So that layer is crucial in terms of helping with the absorption of harmful radiation, as well as maintaining the global temperature on, on the surface of the Earth. And we've mentioned the term global warming and the natural effect of that on the Earth. And so these gases play an important role in maintaining the temperature on the surface of the Earth. So if we unpack that by looking at the composition of gases in the atmosphere, we can see that nitrogen forms a significant component of the gases with oxygen being the second largest component, making up 
We know that carbon dioxide is a very small amount that is steadily increasing, and, we'll, and that's due to human activity with the other gases forming a very small percentage of that. So guys, the atmosphere is made up of different gases, and these gases are crucial to us being able to survive on Earth, and we know that through human activity, there's a concern around the level of carbon dioxide increasing. And so that's something that we will unpack in another lesson. When we look at the atmosphere, it's important to recognize that the atmosphere is made up of different layers. And this is an extension to our understanding of the atmosphere. So we have a layer called the troposphere, which is then surrounded by the stratosphere, which in turn is enclosed on the external surface by the mesosphere. And then right on the outside, we have the thermosphere. So these various levels are the levels of gases that make up the atmosphere. So let's try and understand what the troposphere is. So the troposphere is the layer closest to the surface of the Earth, and we see that that's the layer that we have access to immediately. It extends to about 10 kilometers above the sea level. Humans and plants live in this layer, so we have all forms of life interacting in this. So when we look at planes and birds, they also fly in this layer. As the layer goes higher, the air becomes thinner. And often we experience this as a concept in people that are involved in climbing of mountains. As the altitude increases or the height above sea level, we find that the air becomes thinner. And essentially, the concept of thinner refers to the depletion of the level of oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's the concept of air becoming thinner. The other layers include the stratosphere, which is about 50 kilometers above sea level. When we look at that, that's significantly higher. It's about 50 kilometers above sea level. If we then look at the mesosphere, which is again measured about 85 kilometers above sea level. So if we were to move 85 kilometers above sea level, that's significantly high, we will move into an area called the mesosphere. And then finally, we have the thermosphere, which is about 500 kilometers above sea level, and then surrounding the atmosphere, we'll get into the outer space called the exosphere. So these are essentially the layers in the atmosphere. Okay, the hydrosphere, the word hydro refers to water. So this would refer to the layers that are involved with supporting water. So, and life forms in water. So this consists of water on Earth, and this would include the oceans, which are both the salt water, as well as your estuaries, as well as rivers and lakes, which are your fresh water systems. Your fresh water makes up 3% of your hydrosphere, while the remaining 97% is made up of your oceans. And as we describe, discuss this point, it's important that we recognize that our fresh water ecosystems are only 3%. And so if we were to translate that in terms of the access of drinking water to humans, it means that we have significantly a small percentage of that water that is accessible. And within that 3%, we often find that freshwater system, a very small percentage of that is actually accessible to humans. So this should help us to get the context of why it's important for us to be able to conserve our freshwater systems, because a majority of that is made up of your salt or your marine water. It's important to recognize that the hydrosphere provides the water needed by all living organisms to survive. It is the habitat of many aquatic organisms, such as your microscopic plankton, fish, and your large organisms, such as sharks and whales. So the diversity of life forms that exist on Earth, a large percentage of that is based in your aquatic habitats. So the hydrosphere forms an important part of the, the diversity of life on Earth. We then go on to the third component, which is called the lithosphere. And if we look at litho, it refers to the soil. So this is the outer crust of the earth. It is made up of the rock and soil. Only a thin layer of the earth's crust, namely the topsoil, supports plant life. So if we were to look at the surface of earth, we have a very thin layer on the outside, which is made up of the topsoil that supports the plant life. Below that, we have different layers of rock and sand that make up the inner crust of the earth. So this, it's a, it's a source of ions, which is the soil, and minerals, which living organisms need. The soil is also a habitat for many microscopic invertebrates and larger vertebrates. So the lithosphere forms an important component of our 
environment in which microorganisms, your invertebrates survive. And so if we think about that, it supports the, de the development and growth of plant. So this outermost top layer of soil is crucial to sustaining the other forms of life because that is where most of your autotrophs or your producers are found. And so these rely on the nutrients in the soil to be able to grow and be able to carry out vital processes like photosynthesis. So if we were to look at the three components collectively, these are crucial collectively to the existence of life forms on Earth. So we need the water, we need the gases, we need the oxygen, as well as we need the nutrients from the soil to be able to support the diversity of life forms on Earth. So again, the biosphere is where life forms are covered and it's in the larger area. To make it easier to study, ecologists have divided the biosphere into smaller and smaller pieces. And these are called biomes, and then further biomes are broken up into ecosystems, ecosystems are broken up into communities, communities into populations, and then individual organisms. So this is a simple illustration to show you that the complexity of life forms. So individuals put together form populations. These populations collectively interact with each other. So when different populations of organisms interact with each other, we refer to that as a community. Communities in turn interact with each other and the non-living components in the area, and we refer to that as the ecosystems. Ecosystems may be found collectively in different areas characterized by the type of environment, the temperature, and we refer to this collectively as ecosystems interacting with each other as biomes. And then if we take several biomes and we put them together and we see how they interact with each other, we get to the concept of a biosphere. So those are the several components in the biosphere if we were to break that down into its smaller building components. So we've looked at the biosphere and ultimately it's important that we recognize that the components of the biosphere are from the smallest individual to the most complex systems which we refer to as the biosphere. So guys, we've looked at the components of the biosphere which were the three components, the lithosphere, atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. And we've unpacked what a biosphere is made up of, right down to the simple organism that we refer to as individuals in a population. You guys have been a good audience. You deserve a little break. Have a short stretch break, comfort break, and I'll see you back in a little while. Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our next segment. As a recap of what we've just looked at, we've looked at the biosphere, and we've unpacked the different components of the biosphere. In this segment, we're going to focus on biomes, and specifically, what is a biome and the different biomes in the context of South Africa. It's important that we recognize that as we start breaking up biospheres, we know that a biosphere contains many biomes. Let's try and understand the context of a biome and its importance. And how do we recognize different biomes in South Africa? So it's important before we get into that to understand that there is an interconnection between the spheres of life. So what do I mean by that? So we saw that life exists in the atmosphere. We know that life forms exist in the lithosphere as well as life forms existing in the um, hydrosphere. All of these are interdependent and often depend on each other. Let's try and understand that by looking at the next slide. So life will exist where energy from the sun can interact with the lithosphere, atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. So if we were to try and understand the context of this, so if we were to take just the atmosphere, would that be able to support life? The answer is probably yes. If we were to look at just the hydrosphere, can that support life? Definitely. However, we've got to try and understand the context of all three components being able to collectively support life. We know that the sun is our primary source of energy, and that's the energy that most living organisms can access, either directly or indirectly. Let's try and understand what does this mean in terms of the air. So we know that the air on Earth 
supports processes like respiration and photosynthesis. We know that those essential processes are crucial to sustaining the production or the conversion of energy from the sun into chemical energy. That chemical energy is often used by organisms that exist on Earth, either on the surface of the Earth or in the lithosphere. Those organisms, in turn, rely on the hydrosphere, access to water, access to aquatic organisms. And in turn, these also produce energy because we know that most of our phytoplankton that live in water are able to access the energy from the sun and produce what we call glucose. And that energy is available to our aquatic organisms. So it's important that we understand that there's an interconnection between the different uh, components of the biosphere. So life on Earth is supported by a thin zone of soil and air and water. The living organisms are found mostly in the upper layers of the hydrosphere, lithosphere, and the lower layers of the atmosphere. So essentially, as we noted earlier on, is that although the layers of the atmosphere are several kilometers long, it is probably the only, the closest layer to the surface of the Earth that supports life forms. Likewise, when we look at the lithosphere, it is only the top layer that is able to provide and sustain life. And that contains all the nutrients and the fertile soil in which most of our plants and some of our invertebrates are able to access energy. And likewise, if we talk of our aquatic ecosystems, we defer to all the, the components of the hydrosphere. We know that the oceans are deep, but often it is the, the, the most shallow parts of the ocean that supports the ability to have diverse forms of life, because that is where light is able to penetrate and organisms such as phytoplankton and zooplankton that sustain other life forms. So that is the interconnectedness that we need to look at. So life on Earth is linked to each other and the three spheres. There are two main components in a biosphere that we need to recognize, the biotic and the abiotic components. And we will unpack that in a little while. So when we look at the form of lives existing on Earth, there's an interconnectedness between the three components, but there's also an interdependence between the living components and the non-living components, which we refer to as the abiotic factors. So in this segment, let's try and unpack what is a biome. We know that in the context of South Africa, we are having a diversity of life forms that are found in different areas. And these areas are biomes that are characterized by the typical type of plants and organisms that are found in that area. So a biome is a large area with a specific climate, and these would be influenced by the abiotic components. So the non-living components, things such as climate, temperature, altitude, rainfall. So these are your abiotic components. Biomes contain specific kinds of plants and animals. Generally, we say that a biome is characterized by the types of plants and animals found in that area. So these are typically found. So for example, if you look at your savannas, those have a typical distribution of plants and animals in them. A biome is made up of several ecosystems. And as we discussed earlier on, that we can unpack a biome into different ecosystems. And ecosystems are unique in that they form these little habitats that are identified by the type of organisms that interact with each other and their environment. Biomes can either be terrestrial, which are the ones found on land, or aquatic, the ones found in the water. Our terrestrial biomes are named after the dominant vegetation in that area. So when we unpack our terrestrial biomes, we would need to realize that biomes are often characterized by the type of typical vegetation found in that specific area. So in the context of South Africa, we have different biomes, and these terrestrial biomes are either broken up into the seven different areas, or our aquatic biomes are also broken up into three or four different areas. Let's try and unpack what the terrestrial biomes are. As I quickly move to changing the color of my pen, this map indicates the distribution of our seven biomes. It's important that we recognize that each biome is characterized by the type of plants and animals found in that area. South Africa is home to seven distinct terrestrial biomes. If we look at it, our savanna biomes, which are coded in red, form predominantly the largest biomes 
in South Africa. This predominant red color indicates the distribution of that. So if you look at it, it's predominantly in the Northern Cape, Namibia. If we go through along here, the northern parts of Gauteng and along the east, the, the east coast of South Africa. The next barn that we look at are your grasslands. And so this is indicated by the key, which is yellow. And so as we know that these are the areas that are typically found along, this would be Gauteng and the southern parts or the northern parts of the KwaZulu-Natal and then your uh, Blomfontein in that area there. Other biomes include the Namakuru, which we see in this brown shade here. And these are characterized by the dry, arid conditions found in there. Further, if we move towards the west coast here, we find that this is your succulent Karoo. And these contain plants that are typically adapted to those cold conditions and dry, arid conditions. Unique to South Africa is the Cape Feinbos, which we find along the southwestern areas. And these are typical to plants that are endemic to South Africa. If we go further into this, we can see that we've got scatters of these purple areas called the thicket biomes. And these are areas along the eastern coast of South Africa. And then we also need to recognize that we've got forest biomes along the eastern coast of South Africa. So guys, these are the seven different biomes that we have that are terrestrial. We also need to refer to the aquatic biomes that we have. And these aquatic biomes are areas that are made up of either your freshwater biomes or your marine biomes. And in South Africa, we have a diversity of dams and lakes, rivers and wetlands that make up the freshwater ecosystems. As we have freshwater ecosystems, we also need to recognize that we have your marine ecosystems. And these are ecosystems that contain water that is salty, so they have different percentages or concentrations of salt, as well as different terrains and areas. Your sandy shores, typically found in areas where the beaches are filled with sand. You have rocky shores, which form a different type of biome, where the sea or the shore is filled with rocks. You've got coral reefs, which are found along the St. Lucia, which is unique to South Africa, and it's only one predominant area. You've got your mangrove swamps, which are areas where rivers meet and into seas. And then estuaries, which are seen as our important wetlands of South Africa. And we have the open oceans and the open seas, which form predominantly a larger part of the bio. <music>
things like the temperature, the soil, the pH, the amount of light, altitude. We're going to unpack those in a little while. Ecosystems may vary in size as well as complexity. An example of this, it could be a freshwater pond. It could be a fallen, rotten log, a rock pool. So each of these form little areas where you have a unique diversity of interactions between the living and the non-living components. Yes, guys, a rotting log can be an ecosystem in that you would find bacteria, you would find many invertebrates, you would find some fungi that growing in there. So these are, again, a complexity of unique distribution of life forms in a specific area. The organisms in an ecosystem display adaptations for survival in that unique environment. It's also important that we recognize that in a biome, you have organisms adapted to living in those specific conditions. And that is what defines a biome. It's the ecosystems that have unique adaptations within them. There's a sustainable flow of energy through an ecosystem and the recycling of nutrients. So we need to understand that each of your ecosystems produce and recycle energy from that environment. And collectively, there's an interconnectedness between ecosystems. And we see that there's a flow of energy between ecosystems. And that is what we refer to as the complexities of ecosystems. So here's an image that shows you both, as I mentioned, you've got your You've got a log, and within that log, you've got specific interactions. You've got the aquatic parts of the environment. You've got the terrestrial parts of the environment. And all of these collectively interact with each other. So an ecosystem is a smaller component which has a variety of organisms interacting with them. As we look at ecosystems, it's important that we understand that there's an organization within ecosystems. And that organization is often linked to how the energy and the nutrients flow. If we were to look at this, we know that all forms of life on Earth really rely on the radiation from the, from the sun. So we have plants and we have aquatic organisms that are able to use that, 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 chemical, that solar energy to produce chemical energy. Those producers in turn produce energy for other consumers. And so we have these consumers that feed off them. We've got secondary consumers that feed off. So we're seeing a complexity of energy flowing as we're seeing there's a complexity of nutrients flowing. And so there's energy that is produced, there's energy that is lost. And so that cycle of energy being converted and utilized between individuals in an ecosystem refers to the organization of an ecosystem. Remember that energy flows in an ecosystem. Along with that, there's an exchange of nutrients between the living and the non-living components. So as we started off, we mentioned that those were the biotic components. Let's try and understand what the abiotic components of an ecosystem are. As I mentioned that the abiotic components are the non-living components, and these can be broadly classified into the climatic conditions, the edaphic conditions, and the physiographic conditions. What do I mean by that? Let's try and unpack that. So when we talk of our climatic factors, we refer to those factors that are aspects of the climate. So the light and the availability of light, the temperature of the environment, the type of water and the amount of water, so it could be fresh water, marine, the composition of atmospheric gases, as well as the velocity of wind in those areas. So these are the climatic factors. And all of these factors collectively can influence the diversity of life forms in an ecosystem. When we talk of the edaphic factors, we refer to those factors that are in the soil and all its properties. So the type of soil, we will discuss that, as in different types of soils support life forms. The water content in the soil its ability to be able to hold water, along with the air available in the soil for the growth of plants as well as the sustaining of other life forms, the minerals in the soil as well as the pH of the soil. So these are the edaphic factors or factors that are as a result of the type of soil and the amount of nutrients and pH of the soil. These in turn also influence the living forms. And finally, we have the physiographic factors 
And the physiographic factors actually refer to the lay of the land. So when we talk about the lay of the land, we refer to the, the, the type of land, its situation in terms of geographically. So this is in context of the aspect. An aspect would be the amount of light that the area receives, the slope in terms of the terrain. So you find that it's mountainous, you have slopes that are facing the sun or away from the sun. So that refers to the slopes. And we also refer to the altitude. And the altitude is the height of an area above sea level. And collectively, all of these physiographic factors can influence the complexity of life in an ecosystem. So these factors have an effect on the distribution of the numbers and the types of organisms found in an area. So guys, as we wrap this segment up, we've looked at ecosystems and the components of the biotic and the abiotic factors. You deserve a short break, have a little comfort break, and I'll see you back in a little while. Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our final segment for today. In our segment today, we're going to focus on the, the biotic factors. Yes, we've just looked at the abiotic factors in the context of the biosphere. It's important that we recognize that a biosphere has different components. And today, in this segment, we're focusing on the ecosystem. Biotic components refer to the living components of an ecosystem. These would include the different organisms, whether they are the herbivores, the producers, the autotrophs, those are the living org organisms. However, it's important that we recognize that as we've just discussed the abiotic factors, that the living components interact with each other and their non-living components. So in this segment, we're going to focus on the biotic components in an ecosystem. So as I mentioned, the biotic components are the living components of an ecosystem. Let's start off with right at the bottom of a food chain. We have producers, and these producers are those organisms that are able to produce energy for an ecosystem. And these consist of plants, as well as your microscopic phytoplankton and zooplankton that, that live in water. So we refer to these as your producers. Producers are those individuals that are able to convert energy from the sun into chemical energy. And they form an important component of an ecosystem. So plants that can photosynthesize make their own food. We know that we have microorganisms such as zooplankton that are able to live in water and utilize energy from the sun and produce energy. And those are, again, the primary source of energy for many other consumers in a food chain. So those are your producers. We also refer to producers as your autotrophs. So the term autotrophs refers to organisms that are capable of being able to synthesize food by themselves or produce food. And that's predominantly through the process called photosynthesis. We also know that there are certain bacteria and other microorganisms that are autotrophic, essentially being able to produce energy or food by themselves. So they rely on the energy from the sun and they carry out processes such as photosynthesis and they convert that radiant energy into chemical energy. And we refer to those organisms as your autotrophs. The next co component of a biotic component would be the consumers. The word consume refers to be able to use. So organisms that cannot man manufacture their own food and get their en energy from the food that they eat are called consumers. These include bacteria, fungi, protists, and your animals. So guys, your consumers often are those individuals that rely on your autotrophs. So they feed off your autotrophs. So they cannot carry out processes like photosynthesis. So they rely on your producers, your primary producers, for the energy. So they consume other organisms, and hence the term consumers. We also use the term heterotrophs. So we discussed that your primary producers were called autotrophs or autotrophic. Now we can use the term heterotrophs to describe other organisms that are consuming individuals. So your heterotrophs refer to individuals in an environment that cannot manufacture their own food, but rely on other producers 
for energy. So again, the term heterotrophic. Consumers are named according to what they eat. So we know that in a food chain, you get in, in individuals that are found right at the bottom and refer to them as your primary consumers. So these are your individuals that are right at the bottom of the food chain that are consuming plants directly. So we refer to them as your primary consumers. And these are generally your herbivores that eat plants. Amongst your primary consumers, you have different types of herbivores depending on what they eat. So you have your browsers, you have your grazers that feed on different parts of the ecosystem. So again, your primary consumers are your herbivores and these, again, as I mentioned, can vary according to which parts of the ecosystem they consume. So this illustration shows you here we've got the buffalo and we've got some springbok here that are consuming different parts of the grass. Okay, we then move on to a second com consumer, which is called the secondary consumers. And we know that South Africa is a country that's rich, rich in diversity, and we find a large degree of secondary consumers that feed on our primary consumers, so your herbivores. So these would be consumers that are generally feeding on your primary producers or consumers. These include your larger carnivores, which are your meat-eating these are often predatory individuals, and they would have to hunt, kill, and eat their prey. So your carnivores include your lions, your leopards, your cheetahs, your wild dogs. And so these are complex individuals that live in societies where their existence depends on how, how, how well they access food. So your carnivores are generally larger organisms that live together in larger organizations that hunt together or track prey together. So we often refer to them as predatory consumers that kill and eat their prey. We also know that in addition to your consumers, we have scavengers. Now scavengers are those individuals that feed off the remains of dead animals. So one would question, what's the significance of this? Guys, remember that when we have your consumers such as lions or your larger predators that feed off the carcasses, there's often remains of those carcasses that are left. So this would indicate to you, this is a vulture, an African vulture, which is obviously a scavenger that feeds off the remains of the kills. So and these are important recyclers of the energy in an ecosystem. So the scavengers ensure that they consume the remains of dead animals. So they will ensure that they, the rotting, decomposing meat that is left out in the savannas and the grasslands are being consumed by these. So these often are referred to as the guys that do the cleaning up, an important part of the ecosystem where scavengers are able to remove the, uh, and utilize the nutrients from dead organic uh, individuals. We also get those individuals that are called omnivores. And so yes, guys, we are omnivores as well because we have a diet that consists of both plant material and animal material. Some of you may agree with me, some may disagree because I know that some of you prefer to have predominantly um, a, meat, a meat diet and so you'd regard yourself as a carnivore. However, our natural diet is that we omnivorous. This means that these individuals consume both plant and animal matter and so they depend on what is eaten and can either be uh, a primary consumer or a secondary consumer. So your omnivores are those that consume plant material and your animal material. And so these can either be your primary consumers, which are right at the bottom of the food chain, or they could be secondary consumers, where they actually consume other predators or other prey, and they as well are seen to be able to consume uh, a plant diet. Guys, it's important that we understand what decomposers are. Decomposers also form an important part of the biotic component. When we refer to decomposers, we refer to those individuals that are able to consume parts of the environment and recycle the nutrients back into the environment. Decomposers are a critical part of any ecosystem. They are the ones that are able to utilize the organic remains and convert them back into nutrients that re return into the nutrient cycle. So decomposers such as bacteria and fungi can break down plants and animals and return the nutrients into the soil. This is an image of a mushroom or a fungi, and often these are referred to as saprophytes. So we refer to them as 
saprophytes. And your saprophytes are those individuals that feed on organic matter. So they do not photosynthesize, as you would see that mushrooms do not have the ability to photosynthesize. They lack chlorophyll, and so they live off dead organic matter. So often you will find mushrooms growing on um, dead, decomposing wood. And so if you do feel the wood, it often becomes much soft because these produce enzymes that, that secrete these enzymes into the organic matter, and they digest that matter, and they're able, with their mycelium and their threads, absorb the nutrients to sustain the growth of these fungi. They produce spores that spread easily, and they are able to then utilize the energy from dead organic matter, which includes animals and plants. We also know that bacteria play a significant role in the decomposition. So the bacteria are able to break down dead organic matter, both plant and animal matter. So guys, as we looked at biotic components, we also need to understand the interaction of these biotic components. And often, the best way to look at interactions of biotic components is to study them through food chains and food webs. So what is a food chain? Remember that a food chain shows you the flow of energy in an ecosystem. Food chains often illustrate where energy is produced and how that is consumed from one trophic level to the next. We also know that food chains exist in interconnected with other food chains. So as we would see on the board currently, we've got, a, we've got several food chains that are connected to each other. And so we're illustrating that interaction with food webs. At this point in time, we must recognize that food chains and food webs are also independent on the abiotic factors. So let's try and understand how energy flows in a food chain through ecosystems. So as we started off, we mentioned that we have our producers or your autotrophs that are the individuals that are able to convert energy from the sun or radiant energy into chemical energy. These form the primary producers. They, in turn, are consumed by your primary consumers, and you would see that the size of these consumers may vary. So you've got them from extremely small, your rodents, your rabbits, to larger herbivores. And these herbivores essentially then are consumed by what we refer to as your secondary consumers. So these were your primary consumers, and here you find we've got our secondary consumers. And these in turn feed on your primary consumers. Remember that in a food chain, the arrows indicate the direction of energy flow. So energy constantly flows from one trophic level or from one level to the next. And so as we move to your secondary trophic level, we see that the size of these individuals increase. And so the amount of energy required by these individuals also increases. From your secondary trophic level, we move on to your tertiary consumers. And these are generally your larger predators. And these are your lions or your apex predators that feed off them. We mentioned the terms omnivores and carnivores. So we often tend to find your carnivores here at the third trophic level. We find often your omnivores in this area here which they would be able to consume both your plant material and your animal material. So this is a complex illustration of the interaction of the biotic components. Let's go back to a slide that we discussed earlier on. So we looked at this slide as an illustration of the organization within a food chain. Remember that within an ecosystem. Remember that that illustration shows you the flow of energy. And the energy is an important part of an, any ecosystem where it flows, and along with that, the energy provides nutrients. And so, in the complexity of any food chain, we find that energy in the form of nutrients flows from your producers, to your consumers, to your tertiary consumers, and these in turn will then decompose, and the energy returns back into the soil. So guys, when we look at ecosystems, it's important that we recognize that ecosystems are made up of different layers of biotic components, and those biotic components allow for energy to transfer from one trophic level to the next, and we refer to that as the organization within an ecosystem. It's important that we recognize that energy flows from one trophic level to the next. So as we wrap the segment up, it's important that we recognize that energy in an ecosystem flows. 
So guys, we've looked at biomes, we've looked at ecosystems, and in that we've looked at the biotic and the abiotic components. As we try and unpack what we've looked at, remember that the abiotic components are the non-living components. We discussed the climatic factors, the physiographic factors, and the edaphic factors. To remind you that the edaphic factors are the factors in the soil, your climatic factors are factors such as temperature, wind, light intensity, and your physiographic factors refer to the lay of the land. So that includes the altitude, the slope, as well as the, um, the availability of uh, sunlight. So we, we refer to those aspects. And finally, we went on to look, discussing the living components in an ecosystem. And that we looked at from your producers, which were plants, and we refer to them as your autotrophs, to your secondary, primary and secondary consumers, which we refer to as heterotrophs. We also coined the term primary consumers, secondary consumers. Amongst them, we looked at your predators, we looked at your omnivores, and we looked at your carnivores. We also mentioned that your herbivores were important and that they were either your omnivores or carnivores that we the source of food to them. Finally, we discussed the importance of your decomposers in an ecosystem, and then we finally looked at how they interconnected with each other in food webs, which are important to showing the interaction between organisms. As we wrap this section up, guys, you've been a fantastic audience. I trust that you have enjoyed the lesson and that you take notes from these. Thank you for joining and listening attentively. I wish you well and have a bio day. See you soon.